Hello, I'm Marites Vitug, and this is Worldview, where we take a look at global, regional, and national affairs in conversations with officials, newsmakers, and analysts. Joining us is Professor Renato De Castro of the International Relations Department of De La Salle University. He is the author of numerous studies on foreign policy and international security. Professor De Castro, welcome to Worldview, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Maritas, for giving me a chance to be a resource person in your program. Yeah, let's take a look first. Let's start with the recent sauna of President Marcos. Did anything strike you uh, about uh, the part where he talked about foreign policy or international relations? Well, uh, first of all, it's not a lot. You know, probably only have two or four sentences but they're very powerful, no? Uh, in a way, he's drawing the line. And I would have to uh, uh, mention it, no? Uh, this uh, sentence, no, it says, very powerful meaning. We will protect our sovereign rights and preserve our territorial integrity in defense of the rules-based international order. So anyway, there's two very important points. The uh, territorial disputes in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea is important to this president. And he's also drawing the line in terms of where we put the Philippines in the light of this geostrategic dynamics that is going on in the region. Of course, these dynamics had to do with the great power competitions. In a very subtle manner, you know, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. declared that we are part of what is called the rules-based international order. Countries, of course, that abide to the rules that were first formulated when the uh, international system was established after the Second World War. Of course, this system has been created by the, specific, you know, by the West in general, or more importantly, the United States. And currently, of course, the system is being challenged by two major revisionist countries, and that is, of course, Russia and China. So in a very subtle and succinct manner, he said, we are basically in the camp of the rules-based international order. Okay, so you did not think some uh, reacted and saying he seemed to have downplayed it, but apparently he was just being subtle or... Being subtle, yeah. Mm -hmm. because, of, yeah because of the implication. In a way, he drew the line. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part. You know, our efforts to strengthen our alliance with the United States, yes. our efforts to establish security partnerships with Japan, Australia, South Korea to align our policy with the EU, with, you know, countries in the West, his uh, efforts to revitalize Philippine relations, especially, especially, of course, with the Western countries, is an indication of the fact that from his position, you know, we have simply, uh, we align ourselves with the countries that consider themselves part of the rules-based international order. So uh, are you seeing... Uh, a new momentum in the Philippines' uh, building of alliances. And is President Marcos the main factor? Or what led to this like surge in uh, building of alliances? As you mentioned, U.S., strengthening of alliance, Australia, uh, South Korea, EU, and now India. Well, President Marcos made the crucial decision. Uh, but we have no one to blame but China. And of course, this has something to do with China's expansive claim in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea, Chinese coercive actions against the Philippine Coast Guard, the Philippine Navy, and Philippine officialmen, China's uncompromising position when it comes to a possibility of even joint development in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea, and of course, the possibility of Chinese aggressive action against, of course, the Philippines' nearest neighbor. And that is, of course, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's no less than the former National Security Advisor who said it in front of the Chinese ambassador. I think this was around February. He said, China pushed us into the arms of the United States. Yeah. So in a, that's very clear. And then in a recent forum, uh, you asked the question, which is I, I really found quite uh, interesting, and which... President Marcos repeated yesterday in his sauna, he said the line about the Philippines is a friend to all and enemy to none. And, and you asked that question. 
Apparently, it came from it was an original line by then Foreign Secretary Carlos P. Romulo in the 1960s. But the context has changed. So why still use this line? Shouldn't it be changed? I mean, what, why is the Philippine government or President Marcos still sticking to this uh, well, line? Uh, I would look at it in terms of the ideal situation we would like to achieve. As much as possible, we want to be friends to all, enemies to none. But of course, the reality dictates that this will always remain an aspiration. Because of course, uh, we have a territorial dispute with China. China, of course, wanted almost 85% of our exclusive economic zone. Uh, Chinese, of course, impressing upon us that it's a power to reckon with. On the other hand, of course, we have a alliance with the United States we share common interests and values with like-minded countries like Japan, mm -hmm. South Korea, Australia, India, and of course, members of the European Union and even, of course, members of NATO. Uh, we are not very happy with what, of course, Russia has been doing in Ukraine. So this is the situation. As much as possible, we want to be friends to all, enemies to none. But the situation, the reality dictates that this will always remain an aspiration in terms mm -hmm. of Philippine foreign policy. This is a goal we would like to achieve. Yeah, but I mean, of course, whether or not we could achieve, achieve this goal in the, you know, in the near future, of course, is another matter. Yes, I remember Secretary, then Secretary Loxin added a phrase, Philippines is a worse friend to false, no, a worse enemy to false friends. But anyway, uh, I just thought maybe that could be added to this uh, Mantra. But, uh, you know, uh, Meritas, when you uh, raised the question, when it, this was mentioned by uh, Car Carlos P. Romulo, P. Romulo in, the, in 1960s. Yeah, in a way, the situation is the same. In the 1960s, you had the Cold War, where in at, as much as possible, although we were strongly aligned, of course, with the uh, with the free world, with the anti-communist world, uh, we still were, of course, aspiring that we could establish good relationship with the socialist world. We have we are basically in the same situation right now. It's you know in a way it's similar to the Cold War, but of course in a different context. It's a classic geostrategic competition rather than an uh, ideological rivalry. But it's the same. It's uh, basically the dynamics of the current international system or the global society is driven by great power, uh, great yeah. power uh, competition. Another interesting point you raised during that. I'm referring to the July. 16? Was it? No, I'm sorry, July 12th. July 12th. Anniver yes. A seventh anniversary forum uh, hosted by a Strat Base. And you raised a question about a legislator, this is Senator Amy Marcos, who proposed that the Philippines should be closely monitoring the entry of U.S. aircraft into our airspace, the way we monitor Chinese ships entering our EEZ. What's your take? Uh, but Marites, remember, I never mention any name. Yeah, I'm the one mentioning. <laughs> I'm the I one never mention any name. Yeah, I he, just mentioned he, a legislator. Yeah, or, I'm uh, mentioning the name. It was by Amy Marcos. Uh, again, uh, this is kind of puzzling because, uh, you know, it's a two different uh, situations. Number one, of course, uh, the Chinese vessels that are, of course, operating, whether, of course, they're the Chinese people, uh, they're the ships of the People's Liberation Army's Navy, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese Coast Guard, or the, uh, you know, the boats of the Chinese maritime militias are in the West Philippine Sea without our permission. And, of mm -hmm. course, their goal is totally inimical to our interests. Our interest, of course, is to be able to harness the resources of our exclusive economic zone. The presence of those Chinese vessels are aimed to prevent us from harnessing those resources and, in a way, also effect an eventual control of yeah. China over those waters. Because, from the perspective of China, you know, those waters are within China's nine dash yeah. line claim. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's a totally different situation. Uh, you cannot simply, uh, uh, you know, accept their presence there. Their presence is, of course, a challenge. To our sovereign rights, they are, of course, right. also in a way a major threat to our uh, territorial integrity and, of course, uh, strategic interests as an archipelagic state. On the other hand, of course, the presence of American aircraft and even ships in Philippine ports are, of course, there because 
of a number of legal agreements we have with the United States. Number one, of course, it's we have the Mutual Defense Treaty with the United States, which, of course, makes the United States our only formal treaty ally. And as a treaty ally, we expect assistance from the United States. And, of course, we also extend assistance to the United States. And, of course, those presence here, uh, even those servicemen, are provided legal guarantee uh, by the Visiting Forces Agreement, which does not only provide legal guarantees to those uh, service personnel, they also treat those service personnel as, of course, friendly forces of an allied country rather than occupiers. And, of course, there's always the assumption there that their presence will always be temporary in contrast, of course, to the presence of the Chinese Navy, Coast Guard, and the Maritime Militia. Their presence there from the Ch Beijing's intentions is to remain there on a permanent basis because China wants to claim our exclusive economic zone as its territorial waters. And, of course, the purpose of the Americas here is to provide us assistance. The purpose of the Chinese is simply to deprive us of resources that are supposed to be utilized by the Filipino nation. So, it's so there's so, a, la a large difference. Exactly. The difference is so vast. So thank you, Rene, for, ask, for answering that so clearly. Now, uh, of course, we know, and I think everybody, many people observe that President Marcos is doing a delicate balancing act, uh, you know, maintaining good relations with China and also strengthening ties with the U.S. You know, beyond this delicate balancing act, shouldn't he be leveraging you know, new relations like India as a counter use. This is very transactional maybe, but, you know, in the reality of foreign policy, like leverage relations with China as a counter, with India as a counterweight to China. What's your take? Well, uh, that's a good uh, point. You know, uh, the Philippines and India are liberal democracies. We also share a common interest in terms of our concern regarding China. Uh, of course, in the case of India, uh, we have to go back to what happened in October 1962. You have, of course, a direct military clash between Indian and Chinese forces. So until now, the Indians remember what happened mm -hmm. during that short, uh, you know, clash between Indian and Chinese forces. So they have this memory that China had used force against them. Uh, it has not yet happened to the Philippines. China also, uh, India, I'm sorry, India also have an interest in constraining or balancing. Chinese growing naval presence in the first island chain, specifically in the South China Sea. So we have this common interest. I think the main challenge there is, of course, distance. Uh, there's, of course, a need for India to uh, allocate more resources so that it could project its power uh, more into the Western Pacific. Because right now, the focus, primary focus of India is still uh, in, the, in South Asia, primarily because uh, along with China, it also is, has to take into account a threat emanating from its neighbor. And I'm talking about Pakistan. Yes. Uh, and of course, uh, India still has a number of challenges in terms of economic development. It still could not develop the necessary economic base that would enable it to send, you know, deploy uh, naval and air forces uh, outside of the, the Indian Ocean. But, so the yeah. will might be there, but the material capabilities are not yet apparent. So what, what's interesting, though, is that, as you know, India for the first time recognized and supported uh, and endorsed our, our victory against China in the arbitration case. Because in 2016, they just simply noted, noted like shrug of the award. Uh, so does this tell you that there is already, uh, you know, a new beginning, like maybe India will give us more attention? Uh, yes, that's a possibility. If China, if India would be very serious about its uh, effort to really project its attention into this part of the Western Pacific. But the main challenge for India is that aside from dealing with growing Chinese presence in Southeast Asia, I'm sorry, South Asia, mm -hmm. they still have to address its concern, no? its uh, security concern emanating from, of course, its main rival in, the, in, in that uh, subcontinent, and that is, of course, Pakistan. Okay. And now, uh, I think it's quite exciting that uh, the Philippine military or the, the Coast Guard uh, are now joining 
um, bilateral, multilateral, quadrilateral exercises, even our ground forces with Japan, U.S., Australia, and uh, recently also India, maritime exercises. Is this something new? Because apparently I, I don't remember having this so many uh, joint or multilateral, quadrilateral maritime or ground exercises. Is this because of what happened in Ukraine? Uh, but you said China is still the main culprit. Uh, of course, I, I you know I will uh, consider. Uh, I will have to take into account three very important factors. Okay. No, uh, although President Rodrigo Duterte, in his you know term in office in the last six years, adopted the policy of appeasing China, he of course developed the armed forces of the Philippines. Mm. So during his term, we were able to apply. Uh, uh, we were able to get at least three uh, frigates. That could, of course, be projected, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, they could be deployed outside the Philippine territorial waters, outside the Philippine archipelago. Uh, the Armed Forces of the Philippines is also trying to source more equipment that would enable it to project, you know, power at least within our archipelago. You know, we are now at least have uh, a squadron of uh, F-850s. Uh, and of course, this is of course also a change in terms of the orientation of the armed force of the Philippines, that it had to look outside rather than focus on internal security. So there's a need for the armed force of the Philippines to enhance its security or military engagements, not only with the United States, but also with the Japanese self-defense yes. force, yeah. uh, with the uh, Australian armed forces, and possibly with India and even probably South Korea. Because there's really a need for the armed forces of the Philippines as, as it modernizes its capability and outlook to have greater engagement with other countries. That's one, uh, one factor. Number two, of course, is the fact that uh, we just had the webinar. And uh, uh, Assistant Deputy Director General Jonathan Malaya admitted in that webinar that was, of course, organized uh, by a student organization in De La Salle University, he admitted it. We made a 180 degree turn in terms of foreign policy, moving away from the policy of appeasement to a policy, of course, of challenging China in terms of you know West Philippine Sea dispute and possibly uh, just in case, of course, China would launch an aggressive action against the Philippines' nearest neighbor. And I'm, of course, talking about Taiwan. So there's also recognition on the part of this government that to address this China challenge, as of course we have made this decision to ponder about our, you know, uh, the appeasement policy with China, we have to also in enhance our security partnerships with these countries. And of course, the external factor there is that the United States and its allies and security partners are engaged in a strategic competition with China. Uh, of course, you have the U.S. alliances, U.S.-Japan, U.S.-South Korea, U.S.-Australia. Plus, of course, you have AUKUS, the U.S., Australia, the United Kingdom. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, you have the quadrilateral security dialogue. So you have a convergence of internal and external forces that, of course, uh, has slowly changing the uh, state of our defense posture and more significantly, our outlook when it comes to uh, regional security uh, uh, situation. I, I, you also mentioned about um, engaging with the Japan Self-Defense Force. And I think Japan is moving from its very purely pacifist posture to what they yeah. call a pragmatic pacifist posture. And... Uh, Will this mean that there will be more engagements between the JSDF, Japan Self-Defense Force, and the Philippines Armed Forces, whether Navy or, or ground forces? And do you think this will lead now to a um, VFA, a Visiting Forces Agreement, or what they call the Japanese call a Reciprocal Access Agreement? I think it's leading to that direction. Uh, what we call a status of force agreement and Japan, Japan would put ter, uh, use the term mutual. Uh, because uh, number one, of course, the Japanese also want to project uh, their capabilities here in the Philippines since from uh, Tokyo's perspective, we are part of the first island chain. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the uh, countries that are, of course, uh, preventing China from projecting its naval power way into the Central Pacific. So you have Japan, Taiwan, and of course the Philippines. So from the perspective of Jap Japan, we constitute the first island chain. It is only proper for Japan to establish close security partnership. I'm not using the term alliance. It's a mm. partnership. You know, we could cooperate uh, in terms of protecting, ensuring the security of the first island chain. Uh, I'm a part of the Philippines, and you know, in, uh, there's also recognition that despite the U.S. presence here in the Indo-Pacific region, the United States is still an external power. Although it's part of the Indo-Pacific region, the United States is not part of the Asia, East Asian region. Uh, Japan has always been here. Japan has this long history in dealing with China. So at the end of the day, just in case, no? Uh, if the United States would decide to end its offshore uh, balancing strategy here in the Indo-Pacific region, we have a fallback, and the fallback would, of course, be Japan. Mm -hmm. Why can't you use the word alliance in describing our relationship with Because Japan? we have a common ally. That's the United States oh. and Japan. Japan doesn't want us or even, you know, and... Uh, to replace the United States as our common ally. So it's just a security partnership. We assist each other militarily, but the key component of an alliance to provide assistance in times of a major crisis will not be there. We could only rely on one common treaty ally, and that is, of course, the United States. I see. So based on our the Philippine experience with the U.S., uh, uh, VFA with Australia, status of forces agreement. Uh, are there lessons uh, to be shared with Japan? I mean, what can we contribute to the table now that we've learned from two countries, Australia and, and the U.S., in, in forging a new VFA with Japan or RAA? Well, huh? to be very honest, at this point in time, the only thing that we could leverage this would be the United States and its other, you know, security allies like Australia, Japan, and even South Korea is our strategic position. Mm. So, you know, we are simply in the heart of what we call this Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we're in the middle of Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. We're part of the first island chain. And of course, mm -hmm. we are the closest country to Taiwan. So at this point in time, what we could leverage is, of course, the location. That's why uh, the you know the decision of Pre President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. to expand the EDCA sites from five to nine. It's leveraging on our strategic position. In the long run, if we would really put our money where our mouth is, and we play it wisely in terms of how we harness our alliances and security partnership, we could really develop a credible armed forces of the Philippines. Mm. That could also. Uh, take part in developing what uh, separate defense, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin called integrated deterrence. Mm -hmm. So if the you know, our Philippine Navy would develop certain capabilities, our Air Force would develop that capabilities to project Philippine air power beyond Philippine territory, and the Philippine Army could basically secure our islands, then we could be part of that integrated deterrence that the United States is trying to build right now with, of course, its forward, de uh, forward deployed forces in the region, along with its more credible allies like, for example, Japan, Australia, hopefully South Korea, that could, of course, ensure that this uh, integrated deterrence would remain a, a very uh, functional and useful uh, you know, variable in maintaining stability in the region. Uh, one last point. So uh, our geography has has made us indispensable to to the U.S., to the West, to Japan. I would use the term convenience. If we provide them great convenience, mm -hmm. now of course our geography could be replaced by technology, you know, drones, you know, uh, satellite uh, surveillance. But uh, the advantage of the Philippines is that we are large enough to be able to accommodate the presence of a large number of American ground, air, and naval forces. The same role that we played 
just at the onset of the Second World War, and of course during the Cold War, when we have the presence of two major American bases here in the Philippines, Clark and Subic. So uh, again, this is something that, uh, you know, again, geography is something constant. And this is a constant uh, contribution of the Philippines, and you know, fortunately and unfortunately. <laughs> Because by the fact that we're simply leveraging on our geographic advantages, it means we haven't really developed the military capability. First, to protect our you know, important uh, geostrategic location and, of course, contribute to America's effort to build this uh, integrated deterrence. Yes. On that note, on um, <clears throat> very... Uh actually illuminating discussion it gives us the bigger picture of why the philippines is now building more uh, stronger alliances uh, on that note thank you very much uh, professor renato de castro and this has been worldview with marites vitug thank you for watching